As dawn was breaking on May 12, 1858, around 100 Texas Rangers and a similar number of Tonkawa Indians were creeping up on a sleeping Comanche camp. The permanent camp was deep into Indian territory, and the Comanche who slept there felt safe in the knowledge that it was illegal for the Texas Rangers to cross the border, but the Rangers, led by John Rip Ford, had been given an order to punish the Comanche by all means possible. It was in retaliation for attacks on settlers back in Texas. The Texans had tracked the Comanche here by the use of cold camps, no fires, scouting, and the tracking by the Tonkawa, who were traditional enemies of the Comanche. The Tonkawa rushed the teepees, tomahawks, and war clubs in hand. They lifted the flaps and burst through slashing and bashing all inside. Some who got away were shot by the rangers as they escaped. The attack was over in minutes. Every Comanche warrior in this camp was killed, and only a few women and children were left alive. The attackers moved on up the Canadian River looking for similar camps and found another, this one consisting of over 100 lodges. It belonged to the legendary Comanche chief Fohebet's Quasho or Iron Jacket. Iron Jacket had been warned of the intruders by the gunfire at dawn and his village had prepared. The women and children were evacuated and his warriors prepared defenses. As the Texas Rangers and Tonkawa carefully crept up to the village, shots rang out and bullets started to whiz by their heads and kick up the ground around them. They halted and returned fire. During this, the chief Iran jacket rode out from the village in his chainmail jacket, left over from the Spanish, and rode up and down the front line, encouraging his braves and taunting the Texans. Five loud shots were heard and the chief fell out of his saddle and lay dead between the two sides. His jacket no match for the Sharps buffalo guns some Tonkawa were using. As the standoff continued, some Comanche warriors would call out to the Texans and Tonkawa to fight in single combat. To Ford's surprise, some of the Tonkawa accepted the challenges and all the battlefield would stop to watch the ensuing struggle. Ford writes, In these combats, the mind of the spectator was vividly carried back to the days of chivalry, the jousts and tournaments of knights and to the concomitants of those scenic exhibitions of gallantry. The feats of horsemanship were splendid, the lances and shields were used with great dexterity, and the whole performance was a novel show to civilized man. After a number of Tonkawa were killed, Ford put a stop to any more challenges being accepted. During this stalemate, another band of Comanche was on their way to the battle from a third camp further up the river. A force of a hundred Comanches arrived to help defend the village, but the Texans' superior firepower was gradually taking effect. As the Texans and Tonkawa advanced into the village, the Comanche performed a fighting withdrawal and over the next few miles disappeared into the wild. The slow withdrawal had allowed the third camp to escape with all their lodges and equipment, and by the time the Texans had got there, the camp was empty. Ford knew the Comanche would regroup and other bands of Comanche and Chi and Kiowa would now be joining them, so he made the decision to withdraw, on their way back through the second camp. They burned all the lodges and possessions of the villages. Iron Jacket was scalped by the Tonkawa, and the rangers broke up his coat of mail and kept the shingles for souvenirs. His lance and shield were sent to the governor in Austin. In the 25 years after the Civil War, fewer than 12,000 U.S. soldiers were expected to secure an area of over 2 million square miles, home to around 200,000 Native Americans. The soldiers were fighting in a guerrilla war against a highly skilled and mobile foe. Except during their campaigns against the Indians, the troops would usually be in units of 50 to 200 men, located at more than 100 posts and forts across the frontier. 
These posts and forts were mostly in regions that were dangerous places to be if you were white. Most men never left the fort unless on patrol. In a letter written in 1872, an officer's wife describes an Indian attack on their remote post. She states, Night before last, the post was actually attacked by Indians. It was about one o'clock when the entire garrison was awakened by rifle shots and cries of Indians, Indians. There was pandemonium all at once. The long roll was beaten on the infantry drums and boots and saddles sounded by the cavalry bugles. And these are calls that startle all who hear them and strike terror to the heart of every army woman. I had firm hold of a revolver and felt exceedingly grateful all the time that I had been taught so carefully how to use it. Not that I had any hope of being able to do more with it than kill myself if I fell in the hands of a fiendish Indian. I believe, however, that Mrs. Hunt was almost as much afraid of the pistol as she was of the Indians. Ten minutes, though, after the shots were fired, there was perfect silence throughout the garrison. Not one word did we dare even whisper to each other. Our only means of communication was through our hands. The night was intensely dark and the air was close, almost suffocating. Because the army didn't rotate out their units, soldiers could be stuck at an outpost for years, and as a consequence, boredom often set in and of the 250,000 men who enlisted between 1867 and 1891, over 88,000 deserted. Food on the frontier was, as expected, very basic. The mainstays of a soldier's diet was hash, stew, baked beans, hardtack, salt bacon, coffee, coarse bread, contract supplied beef and condiments such as brown sugar, salt, vinegar, and molasses. Almost half the soldiers who joined up were foreign-born. The Irish made up the largest portion of that group, followed by Germans, Brits, Canadians, Italians, and Scottish. A cavalry regiment consisted of 12 troops. Each troop had one captain, two lieutenants, six sergeants, four corporals, two trumpeters, four farriers, and 78 privates. The average private stood five foot eight inches tall and was in his twenties. On the day of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, 300 of the privates had less than one year's service in the army. Most days would start with a bugle call at 5.30 in the morning and would end up with another at 10 p.m. A soldier's day when not fighting Indians might involve duties like caring for the horses and cleaning stables, policing the camp, building or working in the kitchen or garden. Sanitary conditions were very primitive and baths often rare. The conditions at Fort Griffin were so primitive that a visiting general declared it unfit for human habitation. Winters were so cold that soldiers often didn't even bathe. Between 1867 and 1871, medical officers at Fort Griffin recorded 98 different ailments ranging from boils to snake bites. And at one point in 1877 at Fort Concho, more than half of the troops were sick. As if fighting wild Indians wasn't enough. 